Hello and welcome to the Google News Lab Office Hours with Journalism 360. And we're here with some awesome VR content creators talking about how we make our VR stories sparkle. And it's going to be an exciting one. We've got lots of really, really great people. So we'll kick it off quickly with introductions, starting with my namesakes, I think, Sarah and Sarah. Absolutely. Hey, Sarah Riddle. Sarah Hill here from Story of Studios VR. Uh, we are based in the Midwest and we do immersive media stories that people can feel. Yeah, and I'm also the editor of ImmersiveShooter.com, which does uh, gear reviews, tutorials, and other uh, resources for uh, immersive journalists. And she happens to be in our same uh, zip code, so we, we, we snug her up. Collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I love that we've got the three virtual Sarahs all in one space on one hangout. I think that's really, really cool. Um, Niasha, if we go next to you, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, hi. I'm a freelance journalist. I'm based in Nairobi. I'm working in virtual reality and trying to kick off um, a VR hackathon in Nairobi, Kenya to get more African filmmakers involved in virtual reality and trying to make it more accessible to people on the continent. Okay, so you've got a big job on your hands. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Lewis. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lewis Jepp, and I'm the CEO and founder of Immersively, a London-based um, content maker of 360 video. We principally make news documentaries in 360. Okay, great. Carrie? Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm the business intern for Emblematic Group. We're based in Santa Monica, and we have a lot of VR journalism, and I do more, mostly business development and research about the business model in VR. Okay, so something that we all need to pay attention to. <laughs> Hope to learn more um, from you guys. <laughs> yeah. And Brittany. Hi, uh, my name is Brittany Peterson. I'm a video journalist at McClatchy Newspapers based in Washington, D.C. And I do short documentary style uh, pieces and I also do 360 video um, that I shoot and also work with photographers and videographers in large and small newsrooms across the country to um, enable and empower them to shoot more and better 360 video all the time. Okay, I'm going to start with you for the first question, um, because I know you've had a lot of experience in this recently. Um, oh, John, we just did introductions. Yeah, if we just get you to introduce yourself, and then we're going to go back to Brittany for the first question. So John, if you'd like to introduce yourself quickly to everyone watching tonight. Great, thank you. Um, my name's John Hendicott. I have a company called Aurelia Soundworks. Uh, we specialize in 3D audio for uh, VR, um, audio installations and gaming. Um, and yeah, a lot of our work centers around VR journalism and we've been doing a lot of research around the best kind of capture systems and post-production workflow. Okay, and all of that leads us nicely onto the first question, which is around interviewing. Um, I find it really tricky doing interviews when we're capturing everything sophirically, and I'm always having to hide in the most random places, which I know a lot of people do as well. Um, Brittany, do you want to start first of all and talk about how you are capturing interviews and how you're hiding, or if you choose to just be in every shot? So I have... Done. I, my technique that I prefer is to do a lot of interviews with just uh, good audio um, that I'll do in 2D because I am juggling the need to get um, a, a standard video that our, our viewers are used to seeing within the player on our website and then also um, the 360 version. So what I tend to do is I'll shoot a video portrait in 360 of the subject and I'll run and hide for that and then I will you know, capture that for a few seconds, and then I'll ask them to maybe introduce themselves so that I can have some sort of a standard uh, introduction shot to cut to if I'd like to do that. Um, but then I'll sort of open on the video portrait and then interlace some audio from the, video, the, the interview that we do outside of it, kind of like a sit down interview. Um, we haven't done a lot of interviewing on camera yet. It's been kind of opening with the person doing their B-roll shot or as a video portrait, and then, um, and then continuing through the story that way. So I'm really eager to hear some tips from you guys as to how you tend to interview and get people to open up and be really intimate when you're off camera. Okay, can anyone answer to that? How, is people, how have been people interviewing their subjects in 360? 
I'm trying to think. Sarah Hill. We've been interviewing it um, from our hidey hole. So um, we give the individual the questions beforehand. Um, sometimes they're on a post-it note or we're just, we will just tell them, remember these three questions. This is what we want you to answer looking at the camera. We'll go behind the rock. And we, we kind of have a funny game that we play. We call it Marco Polo. Um, but it's helpful to know when that interview has finished because you'll find when you're not in the room uh, interviewing that subject that there's that moment where you don't know, the interview subject doesn't know if they should, should uh, you know, stop talking. You don't know whether or not you should come out from behind the rock. So we tell the interview subject, when you've answered those three questions, holler out Marco as loud as you can at the top of your lungs, and then we have holler out Polo from behind the rock. And it actually works quite well because you know when to end in the, inter in, in the interview. But we find that we get far more candid interviews when we're not in that room. And I wish I had known that in the fixed frame world, um, or I would have never, you know, been in the room when individuals were, were, were doing your interviews. Uh, that's how, how we do it. We use uh, regular old school uh, lab mics and the spatial audio that we use is done separately, but I'd be curious to hear from uh, John Hendicott, the, the audio expert in here, about how he would recommend, um, you know, miking interviews um, and what we, the, the proper things that we should be using when we are capturing the, that interview sound. John. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, in, t in terms of capturing interviews, um, my experience, it depends greatly on um, how much time you have with the interviewee, uh, the, um, the kind of the, the location you're in and, and how controlled that environment is. And also predictably the, you know, the budget that you've got in post. Um, and one of the techniques that we've used is to, um, is to actually be in frame behind the camera and, uh, have the interviewee speak directly to you. Uh, so essentially they're looking kind of past the camera to you. And then uh, after the interview's done, it, I mean, this works especially well if you're inside, uh, just exit the frame, shoot those blank plates, and then stitch those back in in, uh, in post. So that's something that we, we've done a couple of times and it works, worked really well, actually. Um, but I think it really depends on who you're interviewing. Some people will be really happy just kind of being on their own, that they'll feel very natural in front of the camera. For those who maybe need a little bit of help and guidance, then we found actually uh, being there to, to guide the interview really helps and then stitching ourselves out like I was saying um, So yeah in, in terms of sound, I think um, what we're trying to achieve is a really good balance between uh, a direct sound source which will be their lav um, And then the ambisonic sound which gives us a sense of immersion in the space um, And again, you know all of these things I think depend on the situation and, and the budget you have and the equipment you have to hand I think you know, the, the, the simplest setup that we recommend is to be recording a lav in the way that you might do normally in 2D. Uh, most people would have access to maybe uh, one of the Sennheiser G3 units. They're like kind of entry level lav systems. They're, they're really good though. Um, if you are uh, recording um, in line of sight and you are fairly close to the interviewee, you can get a very uh, good signal from those. Um, and then we would use uh, a simple uh, spatial audio uh, ambisonic capture system. And I think the, the most simple one which we've got here is the H2N. And I've got it with a, with a little windsock on it as well, which is really important. I've, I've had loads of um, recordings handed to me without this, without this windsock. And we hear really bad wind noise, which is sometimes um, uh, leading to having to replace the ambience completely. But without the windsock, it's, yeah, this is the recorder. And so th these are fantastic. I mean, you can get these for, uh, I think, about $130. And um, they will record basic spatial audio. Um, they will record everything on a, on a horizontal plane, so they won't capture vertical information. But nine times out of 10, that's totally fine and usable. And these are great recorders. Um, there's a great study that's just been published recently by the folks at Google and the Dublin um, University, I think it is, who have compared different ambisonic mics and the H2N came out really well actually it's very it's got a great kind of natural sound um, the next step up you know people might have heard of the the core cool sound tetra mic uh, which works really well as well um, and you know currently we use the Sennheiser Ambio and I've got I've got some of those here as well so you can have a look so this is the Ambio again with the stock kind of windsock on 
Um, so this is it. This is it without. And then what we would use uh, if we're outside is the Rycote windshield, which obviously, I mean, you can see how big that is compared to the, the, the H2N. So the problem we have with this is um, trying to make it not seen in 360. So we use uh, these kind of Manfrotto clamps to clamp it to uh, the monopod and kind of slightly under the camera, so maybe the camera's up here. Um, so inevitably it will be seen at some point, but hopefully you're trying to get it as close to that upright pole as possible. Um, and the, um, the Ambio mics give off a, a really fantastic sound um, and we would record those with an external recorder. Um, and we recommend the, uh, the Zoom F8. Um, it's got eight channels, so you can record the four channels that the ambisonic mic gives you, plus you've got four spare channels for, for any labs that you need to capture. Um, the other good thing about the uh, Zoom F8 is that um, you can control it remotely, so it's got a little uh, iOS app, so you can get out of frame and you can hit record and you can monitor the levels. Um, and yeah, it's just a really good budget piece of kit. So, so those are the two kind of approaches. It's like either if I was running and gunning, maybe I'd just use this and have it clamped to the, the upright frame. Uh, if I had more time and control situation, maybe I'd use the Ambio. Here's the thing, isn't it, that's um, so difficult, so difficult to, control to control at the moment. The audio is so important, and yet it's the thing that is most time consuming for people, especially when we're talking about journalism for 360 and we're trying to turn around content quickly. How can people get good audio quickly? Um, do we need to use the H2N or is it better to do other stuff and then program it separately? I think the H2N is fine as long as you're really diligent around how, um, how it's placed and making sure that there's, like I was saying, there's no wind on the mic. If, if I was in a super windy environment, like even with this, I mean, this is, um, again, a Rycoat make fantastic windshields. So this is a Rycoat. I think it's called like the mini furry or something. I can't remember what it's called, but, um, but it's fantastic and it's really effective. So in most situations, you'll, you'll get away with this. Um, and as you're saying, if you need to turn around these pieces really quickly, then super simple setup. You've just got one button to start recording and off you go. Um, if there was no windshield and you have really bad wind, problem, wind noise, then um, in post you're going to have a bit of a nightmare to remove that. Um, and it will really, really affect it because, you know, as we all know, uh, the sense of immersion is so important in uh, 360 and audio um, is a dead giveaway. As soon as the sound is wrong, we are removed from that sense of presence. So I think the best thing is um, to make sure if you are using an H2N, uh, to make sure it has that wind protection, then uh, in post you won't have to do hopefully any kind of cleaning up of the audio, and then you just kind of match the levels between the ambisonic and the lav mic. Okay, so can you just show the um, the field recorder that, that John was talking about? Yeah, so this is a Zoom um, F4 uh, essentially, but it's a field recorder that works with the the our Ambio, so it's just a, a little pack, not very big. But again, as he was talking about, you know, having to hide it under the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of scrubbing afterwards to um, remove it all from the shots. <laughs> um, Niasha, how, how are you dealing with, with audio in the work that you're doing? Um, so far, it's, it's been pretty hard with uh, the technology that we have. Um, so we've been doing uh, interviews separately um, for the, for sound interviews and then lacing that into the actual edit. Um, but also we had, I think, a Sennheiser, um, no, not a Sennheiser, a Zoom kit uh, mic that we had that we would usually like plug somewhere near the camera in a hidden position or you would attach it to one of the, the characters in the shot. Okay. And Lewis, what about you? Well, it's a very interesting challenge because the, the question you point you made about timing is that is is entirely and it, John made as well. Um, it's entirely what governs it. So when we did our first series of interview pieces, which was a series of auto portraits of people in Los Angeles in 2015, where we could set them up with lab mics, um, we used lab mics. But where we were, you know, guerrilla filming on pavements and we had clearance to film, and where. Uh, people either didn't have a, a shirt on or 
you know, didn't have somewhere to attach the mic. We simply gave them the recorder, which sounds incredibly crude, but I'd rather get the story than not and having them holding you know, Zoom recorder. So that's in extremis. Um, and yeah, so now we've been using some of the kit that John just showed, the, you know, the basic um, Zoom ambisonic recorder, I found extremely useful. Um, and the great thing is that, you know, you can use it uh, very close coupled with a, with a monopod and a small consumer camera. Um, and it's the ease of use, which is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I want to move on to directing attention because a lot of audio is used to direct attention um, for for viewers and to point out certain things. Um, I'm not sure I'm a fan of that personally. I like to just create that experience and let everyone wonder. Um, but how are people directing attention? Are you using audio? Um, what else are you using to direct attention? Um, Carrie, do you want to pick that up first? I can like, talk about it and represent to my company. Okay, okay. What, 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 yeah, Niasha then, um, how are you dealing with that? Directing attention, guiding a user, all those kinds of things. Niasha? Oh, sorry, That's sorry, the connection's quite bad. Um, a lot of, the, one of the things we've used is graphics is to direct people's attention, especially if there's a lot of information that you want the user to know, but probably lost in a voiceover. We've used a lot of graphics to, or editing to basically um, highlight the main character in one part of the room and then sort of expand and then illuminate the rest of the scene. Okay, Brittany. Um, well, we, you know, I think adjusting the yaw is like my favorite tool in Premiere, just very basic production. And the fact that it's built into the newest version uh, of Premiere is great because that's what a lot of our photographers and video journalists already have, and they don't need some outside plugin to utilize that. Um, and so we'll put the subject in the middle of the frame, make sure that it's opening on a really strong image. And then if that subject moves somewhere else and that movement changes, then wherever their movement ends in that scene, then the next thing we'll cut to, we'll, 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 uh, we'll kind of connect those so that the opening subject is where the final subject left off in the previous scene. Um, and so we've also definitely used graphics before, and I swear to God, I've totally used arrows as well for more of a tour sort of style. We did a 360 bike tour of the inauguration route here in DC before, um, before inauguration. And so we were highlighting a few key points like the museum and where the First Amendment was written on the museum. And we, we uh, brought graphics up on the screen in the path of the route and then kind of had an arrow appear and sort of move into the direction of, of where we wanted the viewers to look. And I know that's cheesy, but it was a tour. And so that was helpful for about five or six different key points that we wanted to show viewers as, as they oscillated during this one main shot. Do you think the audience need that because they're used to obviously watching things flat and they're used to just being given whatever shots that they're being given? Do you think they need to be directed? Um, if I think it did in this case. Um, it was we completely rigged up this situation and it was on a bike. It was a bit bumpier than we had expected. And it was it was a long video about about 25 minutes total. So we did a time lapse version of it. And it was not the smoothest thing in the world. And we, I felt, uh, since I edited this piece, I felt that I wanted to help the viewers as much as possible and really spell things out for them because with the time lapse and the bumpiness, it was, it was a bit much, I'd say. Okay. Sarah, Red. Yeah, so I, I definitely agree that I think that audio is a great way to cue people, but when that's not an option, uh, obviously, you know, like Brittany said, being able to attach action from shot to shot so that there's like a string of a narrative so people don't have to work too hard because even though I think it is nice when, you know, you have the opportunity to explore, uh, you also feel like you're missing things and as someone who is sort of a type A person, I really hate to miss uh, a portion of the story that I think I'd enjoy. Um, and so another one of the tips that I, one of the most favorite tips that I've heard is thinking about uh, visual cues in addition to audio cues that we use in real life to know where to look. So for example, if you are, uh, if you're shooting in a crowd, 
you know, where everyone in the crowd is looking is a natural indicator for the audience to know, for the viewer to know where to look. And so thinking of situations like that where um, visual indicators could be used to give, uh, to give people direction without saying, you know, arrows pointing here. So I think that that was a really great tip that I uh, heard. And also shading too. Um, if you're doing some po post production, sometimes you can put um, shaders within in the sphere in order to let people know that you know when it's where it's dark, you're not your attention isn't drawn, um, but where it's light, where the video is illuminated, uh, you can direct attention that way. And again, as you said, where people are looking, I think it was Nani uh, De La Pena from Emblematic Group who I heard first um, sharing about that, because if you would walk into a room and everyone in the room was looking in the same direction, what would you do when you walked into the room? You would go in and you'd be like, what are they looking at? And so, you know, other people in the shot are, are great ways. Now, as journalists, we can't, you know, um, stage that, but there are times when you are shooting and, um, you know, or, or filmmakers who do stage some of those, those things, um, sometimes you're able to do that. Depends on where you fall on that spectrum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm out of that. Sort of going off of Sarah's use of shading in post-production, I think there are also a lot of lighting solutions that are coming out that, you know, you can sort of use a spotlight. I, think, I can't remember the, the, uh, his name, but the uh, 360 videographer with The Economist uh, said that they were using spotlights to sort of uh, direct attention as well. So. Okay, because we're lucky and we've got the audio expert in the house as well. John, um, how, how have you seen or how have you used audio to direct um, the audience's attention and using it to help the story um, within 360 content? Um, so at the beginning of last year, uh, we had lots of clients come to us asking us what 360 spatial audio was, um, how it worked, why it was important and why they needed to pay us to do it. Um, so it was kind of the onus was on us to kind of provide a good demonstration of, of how it worked and why it was important. Um, we, we created a piece uh, with a beatboxer, Reaps One, uh, that was called Does Not Exist, and it relied probably 80% on the audio guiding you. Um, and yeah, very quickly we shot it in lots of different acoustic environments from like a warehouse to a desert to a living room and uh, the performer would be moving all around us in 360 and we can hear, hear that spatialized. Um, and it was a really interesting balance between having the audio lead us and then uh, having the visuals kind of lead us as well. And I, you know, for that, it was really essential to work closely with the uh, visual director. So it was co-directed by myself and um, Gwen Lydiard from The Mill. And we kind of worked together to uh, to, to really choreograph all of the blocking in that scene. Now it was a very creative project, so we were completely free to um, manipulate it as we wanted, but I realise in, in real life we don't have that option all the time. Um, I'd say that I, I would like to, you know, I've worked on projects as well where I have been directing attention through sound. Again, that needs to be worked out before we shoot. Um, and it definitely, it can help in dramatic situations. And if you think about kind of horror, it's, you know, it kind of, it can work pretty well. You know, the sound of like a glass dropping over here and, you know, directing your attention. But, you know, it can be a bit cheesy as well. It's just like this very obvious <laughs> sound just like coming from over here. Um, and also, I think we need to bear in mind that uh, I don't know what the statistics are on this, but not everyone is going to be listening in ideal situations with great headphones that will give them spatial audio. You know, a lot of people are consuming this uh, on Facebook or uh, YouTube on a browser, um, and in which case they won't have the benefits of spatial audio. So, although I'd like to say, yes, it's really important to be considering the spatial audio and being able to direct attention using that. I'd say for real life um, situations, you know, where you look at how people are consuming this content, it might not be appropriate. Okay. Um, moving on to what works in, in VR. And I think we've all probably done stories that haven't worked. 
Um, I've done some bad stories that haven't worked in, in VR. I, I did one around a market and I thought it was going to be great because I could imagine everything. But when I was there, I wanted to frame the shots and I'm like, this works better flat. Um, has anyone else had similar experiences on what, what doesn't work in VR? When, when should we be using it and when should we definitely not be using it? Um, Brittany, we'll come to you first. Sorry about that. Um, so I love covering extreme sports and I did that a lot in 2D video and I'm trying to do that in 360 video. And so far I've successfully had it uh, filmed when it's on a tripod, but not when it's mounted to the athlete or to the moving bumpy vehicle um, on you know, the, of the sport I'm trying to film. I recently took uh, out the new uh, Samsung Gear 360, the 2017 version, on a mountain biking <laughs> adventure. Um, and it was just gravel. This wasn't any crazy mountain biking, but it was, it was still, I think, too bumpy for the viewer. But I will be editing and publishing that soon, so maybe uh, you guys can give me some feedback on that. Um, but we'll shoot basketball practices and uh, different events, but with and cheerleading and, and whatnot, but with the camera on the tripod. So I'm super eager to find the right mounts and uh, the right setup to, to get into some more hard to reach, more edgy situations kind of attached to the, the athlete or some tool that they're using. But I've yet to find the right tools to be able to do that in the smoothest way possible. So far I've been jamming on uh, the Nikon key mission. I, I thought, uh, it could work with my GoPro mounts because it kind of looks like it should work. And the first time I jammed it on there, it doesn't fit, but it got, it's got stuck. And so I was able to put it on top of a car and drive around safely because that thing is not coming off with how stuck it got on there. But I'm still looking for some better mounts. Okay, Carrie, um, what, what do you think works from kind of the, the business perspective? like making money out of content, the, the business um, needs, all that kind of thing. What works and what doesn't in VR? Well, I think so far the contents need to be very um, in related to what people cares about, what people are already paying for. So like we have a lot of social impact related contents and we showcase a museum and people who go to museum, they already care about those social issues. So a lot of people were so emotional and they was like, it's great. They're going to show it with you, share that with their friends. Um, but like when I talk to my friend from business school, for example, they don't care that much about the social cookies. And then they care more about the, for example, like cinematic um, experience, the movie they already know. Um, so talking about that recently, I'm doing some research about um, what VR strategy Chinese company have. And a lot of them are thinking big about utilizing their IP. So. Uh, once they release a new film, they're going to have VR content and VR game on top of the regular mobile games and the regular 3D games. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess you need to attract your audience based on what they are already care about. Like you're not going to make people who love mm -hmm. entertainment to care that much about social impact and also using the new technology to understand that issues originally they don't care so much about. Okay, so wide range of things, but it, it is, it's down to what an audience is actually wanting. Um, Lewis, um, what do you think works and what doesn't work in VR? What, what should we not be filming in VR? Well, one thing I think we should, um, if I can switch that into a positive, I think one thing to take <laughs> care to get right is um, the close field when you're filming anything in 360. Because um, I think Felix and Paul made a very good point to South by Southwest this year that in composing in 360, they think of close field as being more important than the fact that you're in a 360 sphere. And the reason I think that is so important is that we mustn't forget about the viewer. Um, when we make this content, yes, we're, we're doing great stuff and people know that it's a new format, but it's a three-way pact between you know, the filmmaker, the subject, and the publisher. And if you think about the viewer, we're asking them to be a, a sun in the middle of a solar system. And, in, and it's a completely different way of experiencing content. 
if you get the close field correct, you're giving them some markers so they understand where they are and how to gauge the narrative. So it's a slightly existential idea, but I think that is why it's so important that when people are experimenting in this field, that they work very hard on what, you know, that close field proximity, what really works? How do they get people's interest? Because then if you get that right, the outer field, um, you know, looks after itself as a supporting act, as it were. So to my mind, what is really powerful is the close field and the, and the far field, as it were. And so the key thing is um, when you're thinking, you know, what doesn't, doesn't work, think about something that's extremely engaged in a close field so that if we're perhaps doing an interview, if that interview can be, if the actual setting can be close field as well, so you get a lot of incidental richness from the actual physical setting, um, it's not only contextual, but it's close enough that it's, people feel they're engaging with the physical part of the story, the surroundings. Um, and that's just one way in which, you know, really focusing on close field, you can make something which is apparently simple, very rich. Okay. Um Actually, Sarah and Sarah, can I come to you now on the same thing? Um, just because I'll, I'll ask you both, both together around that same theme. What, what, what doesn't work in VR? What should we just be filming flat or, or not filming at all? Um, in my opinion, we should break the China. So it, it seems like, um, you know, early on we were really using this medium with kid gloves as this, oh, it's only reserved for certain circumstances. And to me, the only way we're going to learn how to tell stories properly in the space is to tell a lot of bad stories. Um, and, and we've all, you know, told stories that should have never um, been told in a spherical environment, but we did it because we needed to know how to do it. So to me, I think we need to, we need to break the China. We need to see what works and, and what don't, doesn't work. Don't put it up on a shelf that you only bring it out for special occasions because, you know, that's not how you, you, you learn in a medium. Yeah, I tend to agree, and I think since so many people are still watching these uh, videos on desktop and on mobile, they can always reframe and they can always sort of choose their own view. So I don't think for those, you know, 90% of people, if we do something uh, in 360 that we maybe should have done fixed frame, I don't think that we're necessarily uh, discounting their experience. I mean, I've seen a lot of videos that are, um, you know, did not need to be 360, but I can always choose what I look at and, and create my own flat fixed frame experience from that 360. And I think as the technology improves too with like over capture and being able to transition into and out of 360 environments into fixed frame, I think that the any rules that we set now are just, they're going to change. So I agree with Sarah, break the China. Yeah, and, and that having that said, from a, a, you know teaching environments, there absolutely needs to be rules on what should and shouldn't. Like we should have that that general guidance, um, but maybe not use that as a limiting limiting factor to us. Okay, now Asha, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see hear from you on on this as well. Have you been filming everything, making the most of the technology, and filming everything spherically, or are you picking and choosing stories um, depending on what you think will work and not work? Um, now, Asha, what what was your thoughts on it? Mainly for us, we mainly film everything in 360 because I think you don't really know until you get back into the edit what worked and what didn't. Um, so it's, it's more, I would say, with every type of different shot or ex like, um, experience or scene, I wouldn't... You may have just... that. Ah. Sorry? Sorry, we, we, lost you. we lost you momentarily, but you're back now. Okay. I uh, always said what I like to do is still film in 360, but then sort of bring in that sphere, that certain experience that wouldn't necessarily work if it was just in 360. So for instance, like a scene of someone watching a TV and then bringing that 2D experience onto the actual flat screen of the television or like opening a ceiling to a different type of scene, um, but still the experience. Okay, 
Great, thank you. And we're in the middle of a Google News Lab Office Hours Journalism 360 talking about making VR stories sparkle. Um, I want to talk now about making VR stories smell um, or adding in other different senses to an experience. Um, this is something that most people know that I like to play around with. Um, I like to add in different smells to an experience or heat or other different senses to create that full experience of what's around us. Um, I might be a little bit unique in that area, um, but I want to know what other people think about adding in different smells. And obviously this isn't something that we can distribute widely to everybody unless we start plugging in smell attachments to our phones. Um, so it might be more of a unique market. But does anyone, has anyone else played around with multi-sensory experiences? And what do you think of it? Um, Brittany. experiences please share I haven't experimented it either and um, yes yeah, so, so what I, I've done is added in um, smells fo following along the lines of the old sensor armor approach back in the 50s 60s um, where there were these big multi-sensory chambers and my experiences as people may have seen um, are a lot low tech and have tents and smells and all that kind of stuff but for me it really enhances the experience because we experience the world with different senses all around and it's not just the audio and the visual um, which is why I think it's quite important um, does it have a place in journalism 360 or in VR content I think it does I think what you're doing with smells is, is fascinating I tell you all the time that you stink <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and I love you too <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it absolutely does because that's what you, as as a storyteller, do. You, you try to place um, it, it into an environment, and aroma obviously is one of your senses. And there's existing research shows that you know aroma, certain aromas affect the brain differently. So um, I, you know, you're you're seeing some of these necklaces come out at VRLA. They had like um, a necklace, and, and Jackie Mori, who's a fascinating individual, you should you should follow her on her. Uh, social sites, she came up with some kind of uh, prototype that has different aroma, different things on um, uh, necklaces. You know, it's not too long ago that vibration in um, uh, a story might have been thought of as odd, but yet you see sub packs all the time being strapped to, to individuals' um, bodies so that they can feel the vibration of the rocket um, or, or something like that. So I think what you're doing is, is fascinating and you know, a hardware person just needs to figure out, you know, how do you do that at scale and how do you capture the aroma of a beer garden on channel four? You know what I mean? I mean, what's that capture kind of capture um, equipment out there that allows you to to capture aroma? It's really tough. <laughs> it's, it's really, really tough. And, and for me, it's about taking you back to that place. And the, someone asked me recently about how I make sure that the smell is exactly right. Um, and this was somebody that had gone off to the Amazon to make a film and they'd taken a perfumer with them and it was this big documentary and I'm like, yeah, I just went down to the market and bought some Chinese spices and mixed them up and I thought that was about right. Um, but for me, it's more that everyone smells things differently in the same way that we see things differently and we hear things differently and we take an experience that's unique to ourselves. So the smell, even if it's produced accurately, will smell different to different people. Um, and it's about situating you in that environment. Um, but it is about the hardware. It's about getting that out there to, to people. Um, but we are seeing a lot more multi-sensory experiences at um, uh, various VR events. Um, so a lot of people are starting to, to do this. Um, Carrie, do you think that there is the opportunity for multi-sensory experiences to, to go larger scale. Well, I definitely think it makes sense for public um, exhibitions. People will be interested in the format itself. Oh, wait, you see, you, you're saying that I can smell something from like thousand miles away and they will be willing to try it out. And another potential opportunity is the another haptic stuff. Um, I tried it out at VRLA, so like you can play uh, with the virtual ball and they use some like air 
you feel like you're touching it and you can even feel the age of it. And currently at Emblematic, we are working on a detective, detective um, related content. It's basically um, as an audience, you walk into a crime scene and you can interact with those evidence. Of course, there will be like clearly like wrapped in the bags and the detective will give you some instructions on what you can do or what you cannot do and potentially combining that with the epic stuff I talk about will give the audience more ideas like how interactive a VR piece could be. Do you ultra think it could go main? Oh, sorry, Sarah. Yeah, I was just gonna say Ultra Haptics is also doing some some fascinating things. I know they just received a, a big round of funding, but the, the the idea that you can touch objects, objects and feel them that aren't there through ultrasound waves um, in the environment. I don't know what their site is, but it, their name is Ultra Haptics. Okay, I will look at them and harass them. Um, John, um, you are the audio king. Will you open up the experiences to smells? Do you think that's just as important as audio or um, are you pushing it away? <laughs> um, I, I think it's a really fascinating um, sense to, uh, to play with in VR. Um, my, my first experience of 3D audio was with a company called Ear Films. And what we were doing is creating, um, uh, we created a feature film just for your ears. So it was up, for, uh, up to 100 people sat down blindfolded in a, in a huge um, speaker array. So we had 23 speakers. And we created this 3D sound journey with the idea that um, when you switch off your visual sense, you become, or all your other senses are kind of heightened. And the images that we create in our minds are, can be really, really vivid. Um, and we were exploring the idea of smell with that as well. Um, we had a lot of practical issues with that because we were in such a huge space. We, you know, it would be like a 50 foot by 50 foot room and, you know, it was very hard to control uh, smells in that environment. Um, but I have seen it in VR and again, it's, it's when it's done well, it, it can really enhance the experience. Um, and actually, uh, there was an experience called Tree Hugger, which won Tribeca this year. Mm -hmm. Um, by Marshmallow Laser Feast, and I mean it was, it was a stunning VR experience where they uh, scanned a 4,000 year old sequoia, sequoia tree and you become like a water droplet that's taken up through the roots, up the branch system, and then you become part of that pho photosynthesis cycle. Um, and whilst you're around in the undergrowth, they incorporated smell into that as well, and it was hugely effective. So again, I think, um, yeah, where, where it's appropriate, um, it can be done really well. In terms of the devices used to uh, propagate smell and to kind of clear that and move in different smells, I'm not up, so up on the technology, but I'll be fascinated to see how it develops. That's the hardest thing that I found is, is clearing that smell mm. and people wanting smells to change throughout an experience, but it's really hard to, to shift a smell and bring in a new smell. Um, and me as a journalist, it's not really my skill set, um, but I'm trying. Um, Lewis, what have you tried out recently along these lines? Lewis. I think Lewis is there. Has he frozen? It's the smells that have hit him, I think. No, Lewis is gone. He was going to tell us something really interesting, but we'll um, come back to him maybe. Um, when we're talking about journalism and 360, one of the most important questions that everybody asks is around ethics. Um, so we couldn't have a, a hangout without talking about ethics. Um, it is always a hot topic. Um, Brittany, do you want to start first? And given the kind of live reports that you've been doing recently and capturing lots of different um, uh, stories, how are you dealing with ethics in 360? Do you think it's just the normal journalism code of conduct um, or should there be more applied to 360 content? Yeah, I think with immersive content like 360 video and with uh, drone footage, I think that those all bring in and very, um, very interesting set of uh, ethics because, you know, with, with, I was recently at the Pointer Drone Workshop this past weekend, yesterday, in, um, in Madison, 
and we were kind of talking about how any thing that you wouldn't shoot at a, at a crime scene or, you know, whatever kind of scene from the ground, you probably shouldn't shoot it from above. You need to apply those same set of ethics. And, you know, I'd like to think that that's pretty similar with 360 video. We just shot a crime scene last week um, when there was the shooting uh, in Washington, D.C. of a congressman last Wednesday. And one of my colleagues went out to shoot video of that crime scene. And I mean, in the same way, granted, you're very taped off uh, from getting too close, but we shot everything that we could have shot from that area and, you know, reproduced it. We didn't have great audio. Uh, we, it was a qu very much a quick turn and we were lucky to get the camera out there. So we layered, you know, there was kind of a very quiet, subtle audio, but we just kind of brought that down, general audio from the scene and, the, and we layered quotes from people who weren't there. And so to not be deceiving about that, we labeled on the screen exactly who those voices were, um, a lot of congressmen, the president, uh, things like that. So when it's something that's not true to the scene, we absolutely label on screen um, just to be very, very, very clear about it. And so far, we have not done any staging. Um, it's been looking at an opportunity and seizing that opportunity and figuring out how we can incorporate it later into the story if it wasn't previously planned. Haven't done any staging, and if I, I'd be hesitant uh, to do that. And if, if I did, I would be very um, transparent about my decision to do that. And um, yeah, <laughs> love, love to hear what everyone else thinks. Yeah. Laesha, um, can I come to you and ask you about storytelling ethics in immersive media? Do you think it's different? Um, and how do you talk about this? How, how do you, you deal with this when you're out in the field? I think it's, it's pretty similar. I think one of the fine lines that we have to is because you, with 360, you're trying to be so creative and come up with all these different things and add different elements and sounds. And it's how do you still stay true to the sound, with, to the essence of the story and what it actually was without going over the top? And I think a lot of times now with the technology, everybody's trying to make something new and more creative and fresh, but it ends up being a little too much really have experienced if it was flat. Um, so I think that is where uh, there's been a bit of an issue with certain stories that I have seen that have come across, but I would still agree with Brittany that in general, the principles are the same. Okay. And um, the way you produce a story have to be upfront about your involvement and where you were in that space and that type of thing. Okay, thank you. Sarah Hill. You've done yeah. a lot of work around ethics. Um, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, and actually it hasn't been me, but it's, it has been Journalism 360. And so if you're not familiar with that organization, it's a joint project with Google News Lab, the Knight Foundation, and the Online News Association. And so they are trying to come up um, and, and help creators navigate that uncertainty of ethics when it comes to what you can and can't do in a sphere. Um, on our the, the, the Twitter feed for Journalism 360 and on their Medium post, which is at medium.com slash journalism um, underscore 360. You'll see some posts from, from, from Taylor, who's created a whole survey of, of journalists, and I encourage you to go online in association with the Associated Press and take those surveys. Um, it's asking questions about the questions that all of us ask, you know, should we be cloning our, our Navy ears um, out, do the equipment out um, in some of these uh, scenes? And reality is, is that, you know, it's going to differ from, from shop to shop. Um, in our shop, we clone out our Navy ears. That's what um, Mark Mayville is doing right now. He is, you know, cloning out uh, the tripod on a shop. But other shots, uh, shops might not be okay with that, and that's okay. Um, it's whatever kind, of, to us it's a production value, it's not a matter of, of ethics, but um, you know, other shops that might not be okay with you, you might always want to leave, leave the tripod in there. But I think it's just important that you have a conversation um, on these, this is why we're doing it, or this is why we aren't doing it. Yeah, and, and it's also on the type of story as well, isn't it? Because if you're live at the scene, you're not going to be there um, cloning out the, 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 the tripod. You're, you're going to be there in the middle of the action. So it really is dependent on the, the out, the, the final product as well, isn't it? 
Yeah, I would agree. I mean, my personal opinion is I think that on at a baseline level, uh, I agree with Brittany. I think the ethics are are very similar. If you wouldn't do something in fixed frame, if you wouldn't do it in other mediums, you shouldn't do it in 360. Even though you have like some 360 specifics, like cloning out the nadir, hiding all of those questions that you have to ask yourself that are different. But one thing that I uh, also think is different is um, is how we factor in a potential emotional response to our what we're creating. Um, so in J school, you're always taught to to write to the lowest common denominator intellectually. You know, don't use big words, but I think in 360, we sort of have to, uh, in some ways, prepare to uh, build experiences for the lowest common emotional denominator. You know, you so uh, Catherine Allen actually ex explained how she uh, views this. Um, so when you're building a 360 experience, think about if you were bringing your 13-year-old niece along with you through this 360 experience. What context would you provide her? What guidance would you provide her? What would you show her? What would you not show her? And sort of think about that person as your uh, lowest common in, uh, emotional denominator rather than an intellectual denominator. Yeah, so true. And you know, that's one of the things that it doesn't seem like we're always talking about, but um, you know, the content that we are placing people in um, can seem really real to people. And if it's um, you're in the middle of a war zone or you're in the middle of something traumatic, you know, people are, are, are experiencing that media far differently than they are a regular fixed frame shot because you've taken away that filter of the frame. So if that's the case, do you know, um, storytellers need to be handling that content um, in, a, in a different way? I'm not saying you, know, you put warnings on, on everything, but you know, at least having a conversation in, in your shops about, um, you know, would we put this person into this kind of situation in real life, and should we be putting them in that situation in a headset? I don't have the answer. Okay, I, I want to move on before we wrap things up around um, the, the role of the immersive storyteller and, and really how, how much it's changed and how much it's changed journalism. Um, for me, I spent 10 years as a television broadcaster, always talking in a flat frame, always desperately wanting to get closer. Now I feel like I can get closer by using spherical films and, and giving that experience to the, the audience. Um, I want to ask all of you um, how you feel that the role of the immersive storyteller has changed and, and how maybe you think that it might change as technology advances more. We'll start because you're both on the screen, Sarah and Sarah. Um, well, I mean, the role of storyteller, you know, look in the last two years, who would have thought we'd be hiding behind rocks, um, you know, um, utilizing additional talents, you know, for instance, you know, Aurelia Soundworks, um, you know, it's not just a one-man band anymore. You know, we, as storytellers, it used to be we could go out, we could shoot, we could write, we could edit, and, you know, post that online. We did everything, and now we can't. It's no longer a one-man band. It's an orchestra. And you not only need, you know, a cinematographer, you need John Hendicott, you need individuals who know post-production, you need a game designer, you need consult with Unity developers, I mean, that's the changing role, at least for us, you know, over the last few years, it's making that transition from the fixed frame world to the immersive world. I mean, I completely agree. I still remember uh, when I was uh, going through college, there was a, a sincere belief that one person could do it all, and I think that this sort of has to change that mentality of, of you can't rely on one person to do every step of the 360 production. Uh, in most cases, you have to bring in experts because you're not going to get that quality from, from one person. So, okay. Naisha, um, can I ask you, how, how do you think that the role of the immersive storyteller has changed, how you've changed as a journalist? I think I've had less control a lot of times on the environments that we're filming in because either you're hiding behind a rock or it's much harder to know what the what answers are being told if you're interviewing somebody it's it's a lot more about a lot more pre-production to make sure that things work and it's also the fact that accepting that well you'll get back to the edit and certain things won't be as you had imagined them and it's because you're just removed from the scene that you can't really do much Okay, Lewis? 
I think the big change is something that starts to come and which will be a much bigger change in the, year, in the coming years. And that is um, how we connect with our audience. Um, the reason that I, for one, got into immersive storytelling is a sort of new way to help people to care about news and to amend a break. I thought it was a, we had lost an emotional connection between newsmakers and news consumers in some way. So this is why the format first interested me in 2014. And I think one of the, as I say, you know, it's a three-way thing between publisher, story, subject, and the journalist. And the I think the, the big discoveries we're going to make as storytellers come when we have a better understanding about how, not only how this content affects our audience, but what the audience then think of immersive storytelling as a format. Um, and it's all about, you know, connecting that communication. And I think that is going to change our whole attitude to what content is. So uh, in a way, you know, we're, hard, we're just on the, on the path to that. We can't wait for the progress. Okay, Carrie Ann, uh, Carrie, how, how do you think um, the role has changed as the immersive storyteller? Well, um, coming from a television reporter's background, I think um, as the technology technology advances, it's becoming less about how a media professional interpret the story. It's much more about what is real, what 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 exactly happened, and we are going to represent and replicate the scene to show it to other people who weren't there when the story happened. Like forget about all those, all those interpretation. Like you need to figure out like all those details within that story. And I think it is because the technologies advance so much. So as a media professional, you need to understand like just like Sarah mentioned, like so many different uh, productions technologies and you need to work well with several different people with different background. And um, going back to the ethic issue, I think um, when you use several different technology that um, the general public don't really know that much about, there are a lot of stories behind stories. Like how do you replicate the scene in 360 or how do you build the VR story? Like what's the ethical dilemma or challenges you face? And like uh, we're working a piece with Frontline and Frontline um, requests us to um, give, them, give them a deliverable talking about all the productions um, process and potential issues people may face just to show the general public that we are being um, as responsible as we can be. Okay, John, does the change in immersive storytelling mean that we should now care more about audio? 100% yes. <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I, I think um, it's interesting because as a, as a post-production company, um, the majority of content that we're working on is being prepared by other people. Um, but I do think a lot about how experiences can be enhanced with audio, of course. Um, picking up on Sarah's point, I, I love how more collaborative this, uh, this space is compared to other traditional media. Again, for myself as a sound person, um, uh, in post, a lot of the time we are contacted when uh, the production is nearing its end and people just just think, oh right, we need to put some sound on this, we have half a day, let's contact them and, and get something done. Um, but in 360, I've, I've loved um, being part of that process earlier on, talking creatively to content creators about how to capture audio and how to um, tell stories through sound. Um, I think as well, like for what I found really interesting in the early days was about how to tell a true story uh, in 360 using sound, especially when it, the goal is a sense of immersion. So if we're covering real life events, um, you know, first of all, I thought, well, should we just be relying on those location recordings? Should, should we just make it feel like we're really there um, and not embellish that? You know, is our responsibility to present this information kind of naked in that way? And um, slowly but surely, we've kind of found a balance where we, we think, you know, that there's always, uh, you know, some sense of emotional arc in the story. Obviously, if it's, if it's a more dramatic story, we've started using more cinematic techniques, you know, through score and sound design. And I think for us, uh, it's really reframed our thoughts on the role of sound design and score in experiences. Um, you, if you're too heavy handed, it can totally remove you from the experience. So it needs to be just very subtly done. And I think that's 
um, something that we have been constantly monitoring and changing throughout our experience of working in VR and 360 video. Okay, thanks then. Um, final question for all of you. Brittany, I'm going to start with you because we're tied for time. Um, I just want your one tip, your one person that you think is making VR stories sparkle. Who should people go and follow on Twitter or other social networks to find out more about what they're doing? So your top tip for people that make VR stories sparkle. Brittany, who would you like to wave the flag for? Uh, I will wave my flag for my buddy Steve Johnson. He is a very understated, very humble guy that you've probably never heard of, but is in the shadows doing some amazing stuff with uh, 360 and VR. And his uh, company is C Boundless. Check him out. Okay, great. John. Um, well, I have, to, I have to mention Sarah and the guys at Story Up because um, they were one of the first people that we, we worked with. Actually, um, one of our clients was Jaunt and they did the uh, DC Memorial piece, um, Honor Everywhere, with John, and that was uh, a really fantastic use of 360. It had really strong emotional impact um, that I hadn't seen uh, yet uh, in 360 at that time. Um, and just to mention as well, I think on a technical level, um, we've done some sports um, pieces with Camp 4 Collective, who have done lots of um, amazing, incredible 2D content, and what's uh, different about them is um, all of the filmmakers are a kind of extreme sports men and women. So they have access to uh, incredible locations and uh, their 360 footage was pretty mind blowing. Hey, Carrie. Um, I recommend Liv Erickson's um, Effidality. She works more on the educational side of VR. Hey, Lewis. Oh, Lewis. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who is your top tip that's making VR stories sparkle? I'm not sure if the connection's going to hold up. So, Niaj? Oh, I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry, Lewis. Niaj, who would you say is making VR stories sparkle? Um, I would say Trevor Snap, who just produced um, the We Who Remain, which is a VR film shot in a conflict zone in Sudan. Um, I think the, the tailoring and the poignant stories and also the environment that they were filming in, it's really something to be seen. Sarah Reddo? Uh, well, it's not so much a content creator, but uh, Michael Mansori slash Radiant Images just because his concept is sort of, if you can imagine it, you should be able to do it in 360. Um, and he sort of has a finger on every single camera that's being developed. So what we're all out there using, he was part of making that happen for, for many of the cameras. So, and I think so. Every, everyone in this hangout, you know, from Aurelia to Emblematic Group to Immersively, Naisha, Brittany at McClatchy, um, all of you guys are, are fascinating and people watching this should look up their work and definitely their sites. Um, also Nick Vichinik, um, he has a company called Revolver Labs and he's doing some fascinating work and really understands from a hardware perspective and he also vlogs about some in inter things, interesting things about uh, directing attention. And also um, Socrates Lozano, Socrates Lozano uh, works for scripts, he does some really good narrationalist immersive storytelling. Uh, with some consumer grade cameras, but um, what he's been able to capture in floods and in, in fires and things like that um, is really pretty unique. So those are just a couple individuals. Brilliant. And of course, like you said, everybody in this hangout. Um, thank you all for joining us. It's the end of our Google News Lab Office Hours with Journalism 360, talking about how to make VR stories sparkle. And I think what we all agree on is thank goodness for rocks when we're filming, because um, the number of us that hide behind rocks um, is awesome. Um, so maybe we should all just carry those with us and it should be in our essential toolkit, um, along with our cameras and our mics and everything else. Um, so thank you very very much for joining us. Follow um, Journalism360 on uh, Twitter to find out when the next one is and we will see you all soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>